Welcome to Judge's Corner. This is Judge Matthew Sabaw, and today I'm joined by a very special guest, Justice David Viviano from the Michigan Supreme Court. Welcome, Hi. Justice Viviano. Hi, Judge Sabaw. Thank you very much for having me here. It's great to be back in Warren. Excellent. I'm, I want to start with uh, you giving just a brief introduction to the viewers of yourself and your background and your experience. And I understand uh, your appointment was historic for Macomb County. Could you talk a little bit about that as well? Sure, sure. Well, um, as you know, uh, I recently served as the Macomb County uh, Circuit Court and Probate Court Chief Judge. Uh, I have been a judge in Macomb County since 2006 when I was first elected. Um, I served, uh, I spent the last year as the Chief Judge uh, when I received the Governor's call uh, and his appointment to serve on the Michigan Supreme Court uh, back at the end of February. Um, it is historic uh, from the standpoint of Macomb County because I believe I'm, I'm the, now the third uh, judge from Macomb County to be picked to serve on the Supreme Court. Um, and it hasn't been, uh, there hasn't been a, a justice from Macomb County in over 50 years since Neil Reed uh, served on the Supreme Court. So I'm very honored uh, to be Macomb's representative on the court. And your experience as a trial court judge in the circuit court, can you talk a little bit about that? I, sh I sure can, and, and in particular how it relates to what I'm doing now, which I think is, is interesting because um, folks sometimes ask me if, if it would have been better preparation for me to be an appellate court judge before serving on the Supreme Court. But I actually think um, the trial court experience is very important in terms of uh, understanding the impact uh, of the Supreme Court's decisions on cases on the trial courts and how they're going to impact the litigants, which as you know, serving in the district court here, we're in close contact with, with our citizens, we're in close contact with lawyers, um, and so you have a very good idea uh, on a human level of how these decisions are going to impact people's lives. Um, I would also uh, uh, indicate that on the, on the administrative side, uh, the Supreme Court uh, handles, uh, is in charge of administering all of the state courts, and so we talk about those issues as well in term, in, on the administrative side. Uh, and again, from, the, from a trial court perspective, I think it's very useful to have a good idea of how those rule changes and proposals are going to be received by the trial judges, uh, by the attorneys, and by our citizens. The Supreme Court is referred to as the court of last resort in Michigan, the Michigan Supreme Court. Could you talk about what is the jurisdiction of the Michigan Supreme Court? The, our jurisdiction is, is very limited. Since Michigan uh, instituted a Court of Appeals back in the early 60s, um, the Court of Appeals took over as, as the role of being the automatic uh, appellate court. So um, in, in, I think in every case, uh, litigants have an automatic right of appeal. So some cases that start in district court then would be appealed to the circuit court level. Um, the circuit court cases, the automatic right of appeal goes to the Court of Appeals um, in Michigan. Our court, however, um, only uh, takes cases that we decide to take. In other words, we don't have to take cases, uh, which was a big difference for me serving as a circuit court judge in that capacity, just like you do here in your courtroom. Um, I had, had to hear every case uh, that was assigned to me. The Supreme Court works much differently. We hear cases on application. We spend, in fact, most of our time deciding which cases to hear. We receive uh, about 2,000 applications for leave to appeal each year. And from those, we only grant two or three percent, so less than a hundred cases, where we'll actually spend the time and have the attorneys brief uh, the cases, present oral arguments to us uh, at the at the Hall of Justice in Lansing, and then where our court will spend time writing a full length uh, opinion. So the majority of those cases would be appeals cases uh, from the Court of Appeals. Is That's that true? That is, that is correct. So they come through the system. Some come up through the tax tribunal, but then they go to the Court of Appeals. Uh, but I think just about everything we hear would come through uh, from the Court of Appeals. Uh, the cases are, as they were for the most part in circuit court, can come from any area of the law. So it could be a real estate case. My first opinion that I, that I wrote was on a tax uh, appeal. Obviously, we see a lot of criminal appeals. Uh, so that's one of the most interesting things, I think, about being a circuit judge and now a Supreme Court justice, uh, is you get to see cases and deal with issues from all the different substantive law areas. Could you tell the viewers how many justices there are in the Supreme Court and, and how it's organized? There are uh, seven of us on the court. Um, you either uh, are there by a appointment or election, although, although everyone who's appointed then has to face the voters in the very next election and have the governor's choice confirmed. So I'll be running for re-election, for example. Uh, our decisions are made 
um, by a majority. So almost everything we do requires at least four votes on the Supreme Court. For example, when we discuss whether to grant an application for leave, whether to hear a case, that decision is made by a majority of four. Um, same thing when, we do, when we're deciding a case. We, you need at least four justices or a majority of the justices participating in the case um, to make those decisions. There are some actions we take that are peremp what's, what's called a peremptory uh, action, which requires five votes. So what we do uh, on the court is meet every week in Lansing. We have conferences where we will discuss the applications um, that are pending, whether to grant applications, whether to hear cases. We'll uh, discuss uh, cases that we've already heard, opinions that are being drafted, and what the justices' uh, feelings are on those opinions, uh, and, or the dissents that are being drafted uh, by, the, by the dissenting justices. And we also dis have an agenda for administrative items, and we'll discuss those, and those are decided in the same fashion by a majority. And how long is the court in session, or when does the court session begin? The court session actually begins September 1st, and then it goes to the end of July, July 31st. So I was appointed in the middle of the term, which was challenging. I had to hire staff and, and come up to speed uh, to be able to, to carry out my duties on the court. Uh, and then we ha and then it's, there's a lot of uh, pressure to get all of our work done by the end of the term because cases that carry over, then the parties have a right to come and re-argue the case and the whole thing sort of starts over. So, so when, when a party... Uh seeks appeal to the Supreme Court, how long, how long could that process take? Is there, is there any a timeline? There, well, there, are, there is no official timeline, but things usually move pretty quickly by the time you get to the Supreme Court. Um, there, the, what happens in most cases, they, you know, they'll go, of course, as we discussed, first to the Court of Appeals, but there are some, some delays happen at that level. Um, in, in terms of putting the record together, which can be very challenging. So in order for the appellate judges to decide the case, they need to have a full record of the case, including transcripts of any hearings that happened in court. They need to be able to see all the pleadings and all the evidence that was submitted. And unfortunately, that sometimes takes time to generate uh, the transcripts and so forth for the appellate judges to be able to have their oral arguments and have the briefing done. Uh, by the time a case gets to us, we're in a little more fortunate position because all that work has been done and so the Court of Appeals transmits the record to us uh, and so once we um, receive an application um, we generally take action on it fairly quickly within a few months deciding whether to grant leave or not. If we grant leave then again within a few months usually um, the case is put on for oral argument on our docket uh, and then there is a there are there is a, a unofficial schedule of time for us to keep things moving in terms of the drafting of the opinion, the drafting of any dissent or dissents or concurrences that, that might happen. Um, so we, we, we try to move quickly, although on more complicated cases or more contentious cases, it can take more time. One of the things that's always uh, interested me in the law and, and excited me about the law is the fact that it, it's really uh, living and breathing. The Constitution, written so many years ago, every day in the courts, uh, it, it lives and, it, and it's tested. And part of your job as a Supreme Court justice is to make sure uh, that the laws are upheld, but it's also then to write opinions and in interpreting the law. And uh, as a district court judge, it's, it's my obligation to follow any precedent set by the Michigan Supreme Court. Could you talk a little bit about if you, if you have a philosophy as a justice as to how you approach that and, and what that means to you? The, I consider myself uh, what's called today a rule of law judge, um, which means that we, a judge's job is to fairly interpret the law and give real meaning to the, to the text of the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, the Michigan Constitution, also to fairly interpret the laws that are passed by the legislature. Our system, um, so the brilliance, of, among the brilliant things the founders of this country did was they created an independent judiciary which was a new thing at the time. Um, in the federal government, um, the judiciary judges are, appo are appointed for life tenure so that they're independent of the appointing authority, the president. One of the things uh, our founders were very upset about was that the king was appointing judges and if the king didn't like the judge's ruling, the judge would either be removed or their, would, their pay would be, uh, they, they'd receive less pay. Uh, so of course it's very important to have an independent judiciary so that um, our citizens know that the judges are going to be fair and impartial and decide the cases that come before them. 
It's also important to, to recognize that judges are not policy makers. The, 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 we have policy making branches, the political branches, the legislature uh, and, and the governor uh, or, or the legislature, the, the Congress and the president in Washington. And they're the ones who make the, the policy decisions, so, which allows the people's voice to be heard through their elected representatives. A judge's role is, is much different and much more limited, and that is to uh, interpret uh, those texts, to interpret the statutes, uh, and then apply them fairly to the, to the cases that come before the court. So we have to, in order to do that fairly, you have to give meaning to the, the plain meaning of the words that are chosen. Um, I agree with you. The, one of the most interesting and, and, and fascinating things about our job is to look at documents that were drafted hundreds of years ago and try to understand them and interpret them and apply them in today's world. I'm always struck by the genius of our founders in drafting a governing charter uh, that still does have relevance today and that really comes into play on a daily basis in courts throughout this land, protecting people's freedoms, protecting people's rights, um, limiting the ability of government uh, to grow and dominate over the citizens' lives. You know, so you pr you're protecting your right of privacy, your, your right to your own property, um, and so forth. So it's, it's, it's an extremely important job. It's an honor, I know, for both of us to be able to serve in that capacity. But f for someone who also has an interest in history, it really is fascinating to think about the creativity and imagination of folks who are able to, uh, to do what our founders did. And, and you have to keep in mind that um, what was done in this country was done, uh, this was something new. This was not a modification of something that had been done before. Um, designing a government where people govern themselves was something that had been talked about by the, by the philosophers and political scientists, people like John Locke and Montesquieu, uh, where we talked about this separation of powers and independent judiciary but it had never been put into practice um, until the experiment that, that was the United States. And so it's, it's very, you know, it's an honor. I know, again, for both of us, I mean, you and I have gone back a number of years and our families as well, um, for us to be able to serve in that system. It's a very good way of, of explaining it. It's very important, but it was just a great experiment. And uh, thank you, Justice Viviana. We're gonna take a short break and be right back with Judge's Corner. We need a claim member. When I started taking care of mom, I didn't realize the challenge of playing so many roles. But above all, I'm still her daughter. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving. We're here to help. million places you'd never consider texting. So why would you do it while driving? Leave risky driving to the professionals. Stop the texts, and together we can stop the wrecks. Welcome back to Judge's Corner. This is Judge Matthew Sabaugh, and my special guest today is Justice David Viviano from the Michigan Supreme Court. Welcome back, Justice Viviano. Thank you, Judge Sabaugh. One of the things we talked about before the break was of the thousands of cases that the Supreme Court, uh, that people want to have heard before the Supreme Court, only a, few, a small percentage of that actually gets selected uh, to be chosen to be heard by the Supreme Court. It, what is the criteria for choosing those cases and, and, and how does that work? Okay, and we, we mentioned this before, so in most cases, if not all cases, our citizens have an automatic right of appeal once but you don't have an automatic uh, right to have two appeals. So our court is a discretionary court uh, in terms of what cases we take and which cases we decide to become involved in. And I, all of the justices have different criteria for cases that, that, they're, that they're looking for, but generally speaking, um, our court looks for areas of the law that have become confused, where the precedents maybe conflict um, or, or uh, have caused problems for practitioners or for our citizens in terms of how they're ordering their affairs. And so where we can get, where we can get involved in an area of law and bring clarity so that the lower courts um, know how these issues are to be decided and ultimately our citizens understand what the rule of law is and so they know how to make decisions about their own uh, behavior, their own businesses or families or properties, decisions like that. So um, that, that's the, the basic criteria, but we'll also get involved, of, uh, involved in cases that are involve important constitutional issues under the Michigan Constitution. 
um, issues between the branches of, of government. Um, and so we'll, we'll also look for important public questions to get involved in as well. Um, we're not what's referred to as an error correcting court, which can be, I think, hard to understand and a little bit frustrating for people. It was a little frustrating for me, frankly, to try to understand it. What that means is we don't always get involved just because we think a mistake has been made. That's, that's something that's handled at the appellate court level. Um, so our court, we don't consider ourselves just an error correcting court. Um, we look for the larger issues where we can have a larger impact on the development of the law um, for the next 50 or 100 cases that are filed in courts throughout the state of Michigan. Because I've heard it said that almost every trial has some errors in it. That the question for the Court of Appeals is whether those errors affected a fundamental right of one of the litigants or one of the parties. So if, if the Supreme Court were to hear a case uh, from the Court of Appeals, what would the outcome uh, be of that? What, what are the possibilities? Could, could you uh, up, uphold the Court of Appeals, overrule, and what does that mean for the lower courts? Yeah, so that we have the full range of, of options. In a criminal case, of course, if a defendant is acquitted, there is no appeal. The case ends there, um, which is why the prosecutors often will seek leave to appeal before a jury has rendered a verdict. If they're not happy, for example, with a judge's evidentiary ruling, um, then they'll ask for leave to appeal to have their case heard. Um, when a defendant is convicted, of course, the case is then reviewed by the, typically by the Court of Appeals if the defendant appeals. And then we have the full range of options. We can affirm or agree with the Court of Appeals. We can reverse the Court of Appeals decision. Um, we could send the case back for a new trial to the trial court. Um, sometimes there are sentencing issues that come up, and if we think there's been a mistake made um, on a sentencing issue, then we could send it back to the trial court for resentencing. Um, again, as you know, the Supreme Court doesn't handle sentencing, and we don't handle trials. So any action we take we have to send the, court, the case back to the lower court, to the trial court judge who has the jurisdiction to then move forward in the case again consistent with our decision. Do you also have the authority to overturn laws that the legislature has enacted if they're unconstitutional or in any way? We do in a very, a very limited uh, setting, of course, where a party argues that a, a law that was passed by the legislature or some other action or administrative rule uh, conflicts with either the U.S. or Michigan uh, Constitution. So the power of judicial review um, obviously has to be exercised sparingly and there's a very high bar um, for us in looking at those laws, but it's a very important part of what we do in Michigan and what courts do all across the country. Justice, uh, when, when those cases are selected that are, that are to be heard uh, by the Supreme Court, could you take the viewers through the process, what, what happens uh, to that case before it is finally heard by the justices? Once we decide to grant leave, there is additional briefing that's done by the parties, submitted by both parties. Sometimes we'll ask outside independent groups called uh, amicus uh, groups to submit briefs on issues. So, so for example, different sections of the state bar um, to come in and give us their opinion on, on a certain case. The, um, and then the case is set for oral argument in Lansing before all seven justices. Um, we'll all sit for typically an hour. Each side gets a half hour of oral argument and hear the case. And then immediately after that, the, the justices, we will meet in Lansing for conference and have a preliminary poll and see where the justices stand on, on the case. And, uh, and then, then the, the writing will be assigned by the chief justice. If you're in the majority, you could be assigned to write the majority opinion. Then you're given a period of time um, to submit a draft, usually it's, I think it's six weeks is the standard, although it can be varied for different reasons. Um, and then once the draft is submitted, uh, the dissenting justices will also have their opportunity to respond. So they're given several additional weeks. Uh, one of them takes writing authority and they're given some time to uh, prepare a dissenting opinion. Uh, and then there's a lot of discussion about the case, even after it's been argued and even after the, the, the writing is, is going on, the discussion continues right up until the time an opinion is issued. And the drafts, they'll be, uh, the, the drafts are always circulated to the entire court. So I, I will say um, I'm very happy and pleased to be on the court with the, the people that I'm serving with because they are a very um, smart, hardworking, and engaged, uh, engaging group. And so we've had really robust uh, discussions about the law and about mm -hmm. the cases. 
Um, I really think this is a new, uh, a new era on the court in terms of collegiality and civility, which I think is very important in terms of setting the tone across the state, not only for judges, but also for attorneys and litigants. And so I'm really pleased and I feel fortunate to be, to be a part of that, but I'm also challenged uh, to really uh, work hard and to really uh, bring, bring a lot to the table working with my staff um, to make sure that we're prepared to do our best uh, on behalf of not only the court, but of course the people of Michigan. Well, I know you, you do bring a lot of t to the table because you've really, when you were on the, on the circuit court, you really advanced uh, new technology in the courtroom, uh, new technology to really uh, bring justice to, to, to all the people. And let's talk about that. Uh, you discussed these uh, oral arguments. Can the public actually see these oral arguments? Yeah, I'm pleased to, uh, to, to I guess I'm not announcing because this has been going on for a couple of months now, but to, to relay that uh, we now do live streaming of oral arguments. Um, we are going to soon be doing e-filing at the Supreme Court level. Um, and I appreciate your comment about uh, my, my work as, as, as chief judge and, and your compliment. Um, I was honored to be the chief judge in Macomb County and to be able to um, bring, do some work to bring the court into the modern era in terms of technology and some of our administrative practices. Uh, we have very talented and hardworking folks uh, at, at our court in Macomb County. Uh, I will tell you that that is um, the hardest working and uh, the busiest court, I should say, in the state of Michigan in terms of cases per judge. So it was very important for us to find new and better ways to process our workload, to do it efficiently, but also not sacrifice uh, the high uh, level of quality that, that our citizens expect from us. Um, and I was, uh, although sad to leave my friends and the work I was doing there, I was very pleased to be able to bring some of those ideas and some of that experience to, uh, to the state. And so, we're, you know, I'm excited that we're doing e-filing now at the Supreme Court. Um, so we'll have a seamless system with the Court of Appeals. In Macomb County, we're, we're working on our next generation of e-filing as well. I was talking actually to my old court administrator today. And I was talking to your court administrator today, and I know your court is doing the same, working on your yes. um, or technological efficiency in terms of managing and transferring data through the court system. I think it's extremely important in Michigan. There's a lot of efficiencies to be gained. Um, and, and so, you know, it, we are, I think, have been a little bit behind the curve on that. And so it's really important, the work that you're doing, that your chief judge, John Chimura, is doing um, here in Warren. And so I, I, I'm, well, I'm excited about that. In many ways, uh, we were forced into it in Michigan, and, and we took leadership from the top, but the fact is that uh, Michigan, with the financial crisis, we had to do more with less, uh, less money coming in. So we've been able to develop new technology, which has saved a lot of money. Uh, and that's, that's been down at the district court level, and I know certainly at, at the uh, circuit court level, and it's great to hear that that leadership is continuing with you on the Supreme Court. Um, before we go, I did want a little bit talk a little bit about your hometown connection. Um, I know you've been a uh, native of Macomb County. You served as a centerline city attorney for some time as well. Could you talk a little bit about uh, your, your connection to our area here? Sure, sure. I, I grew up in Clinton Township, and I am Macomb County born and bred. Um, I grew up in a, a large family business over in St. Clair Shores at the, at the Viviano Flower Shop which uh, put me in flower delivery vans driving all over Macomb County. So we spent a lot of time in Warren and Centerline in those days. Um, growing up, I, I went to high school at De La Salle uh, over on Common. And, uh, and then as you mentioned already, uh, I was honored to be, to serve as the Warren, or excuse me, the Centerline city attorney uh, under uh, Mayor Zielinski at that time and then Mayor Hanselman. And uh, it, w it was really, it was a, a terrific experience for me early on in my career. Um, my family's been in Macomb County. My parents, who will be married, uh, I think they're 49 years now, 50 years next year, have spent their entire married life here. So we do feel a strong connection. My dad, um, like your uh, father and mother, has been involved in public service here for a long time. Um, he just retired a couple years ago from the bench. Uh, my sister Kathy still serves now as a Macomb um, circuit judge. And, uh, you know, we what I think most of us find attractive about Macomb uh, County is the quality of people that are here. Hardworking, talented people, but also uh, nice people. I, I was, was talking to some friends from another community and they were uh, mentioning how when they came here, unlike their old neighbors, the people here actually offered to help shovel their snow or cut their grass or, you know, so we have a really a friendly, safe community 
and uh, our families have chosen to be here. And now my my family, my you know my wife and our three children are making the same decision to 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 stay in Macomb County, to represent Macomb County. So I, I am really proud um, to be to represent Macomb County on the Supreme Court. I uh, certainly appreciate all the all the support that I've gotten and my family's gotten over the years. Um, all the support we've gotten from the Sabaw family. I know that you will continue to provide excellent service to the citizens of Michigan. They're lucky to have you there on the Supreme Court, and, and I know you're dedicated uh, to the job, and I'm glad that you will join us here at Judge's Corner to talk a little bit about it. You're welcome back anytime, Justice Viviano. Thank you, Judge uh, Sabaw. Thank you. That's the conclusion of Judge's Corner. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>